listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts, Intelligent Talk. Hey folks, welcome. It is Thursday evening, the 21st of January. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Come on over, see all the goodness that's Odyssey Radio. Find all the places where you can listen to this show in its audio format. And at the same time, you can come on over to my YouTube channel, join the live chat room that's going on there right now, as we speak, of fellow intrep heads over at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. You're going to be able to watch the video simulcast of this show Join the live chat room, and while you're there, check out the archives of over 360 different shows that have aired on Odyssey Radio and simulcast over on my YouTube channel. And that's down below. You can hit the join button over there, and there's three ways you can become a member of this show, the Intrepid Radio Program. Check it out, become a member, and join us. All right, welcome to the program tonight. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, This is, uh, um, for me, this is fun for me. I love doing this show. And as we mentioned last night, I know that there are some who don't necessarily, it's not their cup of tea, every little different topic we talk about. It doesn't have to be. You know what? You can tune in this show every day. You can tune in this show just the days you like the topics that are here. Uh, So I hope you just join us and have fun, a good time. Join the chat room. If you're here and uh, maybe the topic is not your cup of tea on a given night. I know some people don't like my family stuff. Eh, it's okay. You can still be here. Talk to the Intrepid family. Everybody's here. Everybody's talking up a storm. So I want to thank you for being here and thank you in advance. And for those of you who support this show, I appreciate you very much. You know who you are. I call it out when you do it. I know that there's been some great contributors. Leslie Holker has been a great contributor to this show, as has Teresa Denton. And there have been a few others along the way here, too. Um, And I appreciate everything you do for this show. And uh, by the way, if you'd like to get some of our good show merchandise, Intrepid Radio t-shirts and hoodies and mugs, as well as a bunch of the topics we've talked about on this show have their own commemorative shirt, like when we were talking about Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, I did a portrait of Crazy Horse, and we put that on a shirt to commemorate that series. When we were talking about King David, gosh, a year and a half ago, um, I've got a shirt commemorating King David with David dragging the bloodied head of Goliath across a tiled floor, and his sword in his other hand. You see an overhead view of that. Uh, So there's things like that. There's items like that over there. There's patriotic items. There are uh, 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 join or die shirts from the American Revolution. There's Betsy Ross flag shirts. Uh, There are shirts commemorating Teddy Roosevelt in our national park system. These are all things that are over there. Go check it out. It's on my Etsy page. Etsy.com slash shop slash son of a patriot that's uh my show and by the way if you hadn't heard the very small story of how we got that name i was trying to figure out what's a good name because i was starting a t-shirt company a couple of years ago and i wanted it to be patriotic but i didn't want it to be like shorts for america or something stupid like that and uh so uh we're going through things i'm going son of a you know because i couldn't think of a good name and Rainey's sitting over, and then she goes, son of a patriot. And I said, that's it. So that's where the name came from, and it's stuck. And uh, you'll see, by the way, the son of the patriot character. He's kind of a comic book looking character, uh, pen and ink and color. And he's a colonial militia with the tricorn hat and the blue coat and the musket. And uh, that is meant to represent one of my ancestors, John Robards. Uh, who uh, uh, his family, his father, his grandfather came over from Wales in 1710 and ended up in Goochland County, Virginia. And his five grandsons, his grandson John being in one of them, John Robards, 
Um, he and uh, four of his other brothers became officers in the colonial army fighting in the American Revolution. And so that's who that character is. So the site kind of co is commemorated by him. There's that shirt. We've got the son of a patriot. We've got the daughter of a... Oh, for Pete's sake, I've got it right here in front of me. And I don't mean this to be a big ad. I'm just having fun talking about it. Uh, the son of the patriot shirt... I'm sure most of you know who uh, the Son of the Patriot is, what it looks like, and all that. I'm scrolling through all my things that are on this uh, uh, visual display, and it's in here somewhere. Son 1. Let's see. Boom. Well, there he is. There's the Son of a Patriot logo and shirt. Uh, so, uh, and it's, it's kind of tucked behind some of my ad products that you see that are on here. Um, but there he is. That's uh, John Robard's son of a patriot. And then, of course, we also have daughter of a patriot. And this one I patterned after Rainy. And uh, she's the daughter of a patriot. And then uh, uh, I had people like Audrey saying, hey, I like the brunette hair. Where's the, do uh, you got one for a blonde? Well, there's the redhead. And then there is also a blonde version of daughter of a patriot. You know, son of a patriot, all he's got to be is, he's got kind of blondish hair and he's got a tricorn hat. Guys don't go, do you have the redheaded version? Uh, do you have the brunette version of son of a patriot? Nah, we don't care. Uh, but for the ladies, we got the brunette, the redhead, and uh, of course then the blonde. So there you go. And uh, so come on over, avail yourself of some of our merchandise that's over there. Somebody's going to listen to this a little later and write me a nasty gram like I got once before. You know, you were, gosh, you were 12 minutes into your show before you even got to the content uh, because you were talking about all your stuff. Well, that's what I do. It's my show. So uh, we're in seven minutes now. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the talk anyway. And we're going to jump into a couple of other things. Let's do the Spark Courage for a second. Spark Courage. 50 ways to be bold. Now is a good time to be bold. Sometimes you can't just sit at home and think about things. Sometimes you have to be bold. You have to take steps to do things. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking for one that I haven't done already. I don't know if I have any left. That was last night's. Ah, here we go. Remember the saying, fake it till you make it? Well, there it is for you today. That's today's boldness reminder. Fake it till you make it. What's good about that? You know, it's okay to air our grievances. It's okay to air the things that bother us. It's okay to talk about all those things that hold us back. Uh, the, the reasons why we can't seem to push ourselves forward. But at the same time, Sometimes it's okay to say when you're sitting in with yourself and you go, I ain't going to make this. It's not happening. I am, I am discouraged or I'm broken down or I can't make it. I can't make the ends meet. I can't make this. Sometimes it's very good and it increases your courageousness and your boldness to step out and say, I'm going to fake it until I make it. I'm going to put on the right face. I don't have to wear on my sleeve all of my failures. Although failures, you know, sometimes those are the things that propel us forward. It's okay to maybe talk about them as you've learned and experienced from them. Maybe while you're in the thick of things and things aren't working, it's not, it's not always wise to, to piss and moan your way through life. How about put on that face that says, you know what? I may not be where I am, but I'm going there. I'm getting there. I'm working very hard. Uh, there is a, a lot to be... It, this whole uh, uh, it, um, um, visualizing and intent and putting that energy out and making things happen, manifesting them, that doesn't happen for you while you're passively sitting with your thumb in an anatomically unlikely locale doing nothing. That happens as you engage yourself in making things happen. And that sometimes is a fake it till you make it. People say, well, that's not authentic living. Yeah, sure it is. It's authentic, authentic living. It's one of saying, you know what? I have a goal. I'm not there yet. 
But you know what? I'm going to put on the face of a person who's already made it to that goal. And that's how, in a way, you fake it till you make it. And so I encourage you all to do that, to actively work at faking it till you make it. And that's how you manifest what you're visualizing, where you want it to go. And now by fake, I don't mean manufacturing a lie. I mean faking it. You go, that's where I'm going. I'm already there. And I'm going to put on that face and work it. So I encourage you all to do that. That's our matchstick courage for today. Now let's move into something I want to talk about here. And uh, I told you yesterday, I got a whole stack of things I wanted to talk about. Now, while I was out with COVID all last week, I didn't do a lot of thinking. Um, my mind just didn't want to think. And, you know, it was something that was very interesting. I was telling Rainey about this just yesterday. I had a bunch of, like a series of dreams while I had COVID. And some of it, They were, I call them claustrophobic dreams. I was there, and it wasn't really anything specific, but I kept being presented with some nebulous equation I needed to resolve in the dream. And there were other people there, but it was like the sense of other people and I trying to accomplish things. But my role in it was one that every visual I saw in these dreams was a tangled web of things. And I I was straining my brain, and it would wake me up with a feeling of frustration in the middle of the night that I couldn't untangle the web I was viewing. I couldn't untangle... uh, It would be like taking a chalkboard full of uh, uh, um, geometric uh, uh, um, formula and uh, taking those and taking 10 of those making them transparent and stacking them all on top of each other and blending them together and go, okay, answer that question. And you'd stare at it and I would get a headache in my dream trying to untangle and unresolve and separate layers. I had another dream like that the next night that was something like looking at comic book squares, you know, the way a comic book page is laid out only several pages all on top of each other that you could see through. And so all the images, all the events, all the action in the story was all blended together. And I had to look at that and try to decipher a message in there or decipher the storyline. And I'd wake up frustrated because, and what I found, my brain wasn't working. My brain did not want to attack cognitive questions. Um, When I was awake, I couldn't think. Uh, If I was looking at a post on Facebook and I wanted to say something to somebody, I was like, I got nothing. I got no energy. I got nothing. And I'd push it aside. If I saw the phone ring, I'm like, I can't talk to that person because I can't hold a conversation right now. It wasn't that I couldn't physically hold a conversation, that I couldn't mentally keep a conversation. So this was the tangled web of where I was um, all last week. And uh, then my mind, as my body was healing, my mind healed. And, of course, I stepped back out and I was fine. Uh, Even now, to a little bit of an extent, trying to latch on to a deeper thought or something that's way out there, I go, hmm. It's like uh, in the the musical, the Lerner and Lowe musical Camelot. Uh, Richard Harris, uh, well, it was Richard uh, Burton, Richard Burton. Uh, who uh, originated that role of King Arthur with uh, Julie Andrews playing Queen Guinevere back in 1962 is when that hit the Broadway stage. And uh, then, of course, Richard Harris took it over in the movie, and then Richard Harris traveled with that show. I saw Richard Harris live playing King Arthur in Minneapolis, or uh, St. Paul at the Ordway Theater back in the early 1980s, 82 81 it might have even been. And uh, so, all that to say, there was a line in the movie where he's talking to Merlin, and he, or, or it's, either, it's either Merlin or Guinevere, and he says, I had a thought. And he said, it's like, he says, but I, I, I can't get to it. He says, it's like seeing a hill in the pink sky, you know, and, and, and I can see the, the, the form of an idea over the crest of the hill, but I just can't reach it. 
And uh, this is where he came, of course, in the play up with his idea that uh, not might is right, might for right, and established his uh, Knights of the Round Table and all of that. That's how they comically uh, put that storyline together. And so um, that's kind of where I am sometimes nowadays. I see the little hill. And uh, I know that just over the crest of that hill is the thing my mind is trying to grab onto, and sometimes it's just not going there. So um, so you'll notice it. If you ever see me stop during this show or any upcoming show and I go blank, it's because I'm trying to grab a thought. <laughs> so, But it's all coming back. It's coming back to me now. So... I want to talk a little bit about uh, something that ranges back into that whole esoteric notion. Uh, notion. It's not a singular thing I'm looking at. Into esoterics. Into Gnosticism. Into some reflections on the study of religion. And I want to look at this and I want to call it... This, this can get a little thick. So... I want you to enjoy this. I want you to participate in this. I want you to think about these things. And I don't know how long we'll go with this series, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to entitle it The Serpent's Gift. Ooh, that's blasphemy right there, isn't it? Because you know I'm referencing the serpent in the Bible. And who is the serpent in the Bible supposed to be? Show of hands, were you taught in Sunday school or synagogue or wherever? Who was the serpent supposed to be? Why, Satan, uh, the devil, Lucifer, and so on. Of course, he wasn't called that in the original, as we've talked about when we talked about the Elohim and the Genesis Garden of Eden story and so on. It was a thousand years after the serpent is first mentioned, the serpent being Nakosh in the Garden of Eden, but it was a thousand years later before a prophet attributed that serpent to being, well, that's just that serpent, the devil. And so uh, there's a verse that says, And God said to Adam, Who is it who instructed you? And Adam answered, The woman whom you given me. And the woman said, The serpent is the one who instructed me. And he cursed the serpent, and he called him devil. Then he said, Let us cast him out of paradise, lest he take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. But what sort of but what sort is this God? First, he envied Adam that he should eat from the tree of knowledge, the Gnosis. And afterward he said, Let us cast him out of this place, lest he eat of the tree of life and live forever. Surely he has shown himself to be a malicious envier. What do you think of that? This came from the testimony of truth attributed to writings in the 2nd of the 3rd century AD. What do you think of that thought? God is the envier. God whose creation he created in such a way that he gave him the free will to choose to be against him or to not listen to him or obey him. And then his creation doing, making choices. That uh, God said, I'm going to kick you out of paradise because you made that choice. I gave you the free will to make that choice, but I'm going to kick you out for making it, for exercising that free will. I gave you free will so you could set it here. I didn't give you free will to express it. Because there are certain parts of free will that if you express according to that same God will end you up in eternal separation from him, from his love, from anything. And this is saying that it was the serpent that presented the tree of life. You won't surely die, he said in the Genesis account. And so you've got that story. What do you think of that? That it was the serpent who gave the gift to humans. Now, the biblical story of Adam and Eve and the serpent, it's captured the imaginations of billions of human beings for well over 2,000 years. And what we're going to do with this series is kind of a, a retelling of sorts. 
from the perspective of the snake. Now, is that blasphemous? Is that um, heresy? Does that make me a heretic? Well, I hope so. Um, I'm not a literalist Orthodox Catholic believer, so uh, I'm not a heretic because they're the ones that call you the heretic. But is it blasphemy to say there is a story to be told from the perspective of the serpent? And what you got to do in order to be able to talk, even talk about this stuff on an intellectual level, is to be able to separate yourself from the story. Step outside the box and look back in and examine the story. You may come back to the same conclusions you began with. Or you might end up changing your thinking a little bit. So, talking about from the perspective of the serpent, uh, at least it's how I imagine that the wisdom figure to be embodied in the modern study of science and its uh, erotic, humanistic, comparative, and esoteric forms of gnosis, knowledge. It's strange, and maybe it's even a little shocking to look at the story from this perspective, especially for some people whose faith is bound up in this. I'm not talking, folks, by the way, throw this caveat in there, I'm not talking about Satanism. I'm not talking about the worshipping of Lucifer or anything like that. What I'm talking about is taking the religious mythologies that have been handed down to us and that we have literally imagined and believed and been captured by for thousands of years and stopping and asking the question, is there something more to this story than I've been told? Same thing we did with the story of David. Same thing we did with the story of Jesus. Uh, Same thing we did with other stories that we've tackled. And so... It's a strange way to look at the tale. And it's got the usual protagonist and the antagonist more or less uh, reversed by the way we're going to look at this. And it's inspired by the early, early Gnostic Christians who looked at things this way, who couldn't help noticing just who in the story was graciously bestowing knowledge, that would be the serpent, and who was jealously and rather pettily trying to prevent it and that was God so we got to go out to break now from this first half but we'll be back in just a couple of minutes you sit tight and we're going to tackle this a bit more Are you looking for a really awesome and amazing graphic designer? How about an illustrator or a photographer? This is Rainy Roberts, and I wanted to tell you how you can get my designer, illustrator husband, Scotty Roberts, to work for you on your project. Do you have an awesome self-published book but no cover, or even worse, a cover that really sucks? Do you need a kick-ass logo for your company or some f***ing awesome graphic designs for your ads or website? Then get in touch with my husband for the best f***ing awesome kick-ass design and illustration he knows his stuff and he's been at this for more years than i've been alive go to scottallenroberts.com that's scott with two t's a-l-a-n-r-o-b-e-r-t-s.com to take a look at his online portfolio of work or call 651-468-8115 now go out and kick some ass with some kick-ass graphic design hi i'm my dad so he can take me to disneyland All right, gang, thanks for sitting on through that break. Welcome back to the show. This is Scotty Roberts. You're watching the Intrepid Radio Program and listening to it right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Come on over, see all the goodness that's Odyssey Radio. And come on over to my YouTube channel. If you're just listening to the audio, turn on the, uh, the video simulcast and join the live chat room of fellow Intrep heads. Over at my YouTube channel, that's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Join the show, join the live chat room, already in full discussion mode, and let's talk about this stuff. I just introduced in the first half of this show some pretty 
crazy the 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 notion the crazy idea the crazy story let's flip the roles of the genesis story of the god and serpent characters let's flip those roles around and look at this a little bit differently for the purpose of examining the story all right so uh, what what do we see so far is that we're looking at the serpent as being one who the early Gnostic Christians, we're talking the, the Christians of the first two, century, uh, two first centuries A.D., after the time of Jesus, and before the literalist Orthodox Christian church took over. You've got this period where they, their belief about this character was that the roles were reversed, that the one who was bestowing knowledge and being gracious was the serpent. Now, was that to be gracious or was it to lead humanity astray and to rebel against God? That's the way we're taught. That's not the way the language writes it. So you got the serpent who's graciously bestowing knowledge. And the one who seems to be being jealous and petty is God or Elohim, the God of many gods, as the name means. Now, you got to take the ancient Gnostic myth as this powerful and ultimately positive parable for all of us who would wish to grow up. This is the Gnostic message. The Gnostic myth. To grow up, leave the garden of our sexual and religious innocences, and the two, I'm going to argue about this now, I'm going to argue for this point, are almost always connected what? Leaving the garden of our sexual and religious innocences. I have a hard time saying innocence, innocences. <laughs> so those two things are linked, believe it or not. So, uh, and I'm going to encourage us to venture forth into this larger, if admittedly more ambiguous vision of the world, ourselves, and the divine. Now, I have to throw in this caveat. I know there are some of you here that are very strongly religious in the sense of Christianity or Judaism. I've got a lot of pagan friends uh, in this audience that are very strong about their faith. I don't want to offend anybody's faith sensibilities. I don't want you to feel offended if you have a very strong belief in the core literal orthodox theology of the Bible. This is not to pull you away from your faith. It is to present an alternative view from the early Christians, the Gnostics, who had a very different thing, idea of what these things meant. And they were at war with the literalists, who eventually won out. That's Remember that series from a while back, talking about Gnosticism. And there's no single message of the myth. Nor there's, is there one correct reading of this religious myth. As history has shown us, there are in fact as many readings as there have been generations or communities, maybe even the number of readers. And there's been that many different interpretives of this. Now, when I was in Baptist seminary, we were always taught uh, the Bible verse that said, uh, the Bible is of no private interpretation. Well, where do you get that message? Many people say that are in the faith will say, well, the Bible says this about what you're talking about. And I say, yes, but that's an argument from within the faith. Give me an argument that is from outside the faith that affects what I believe. And it will, it, it'll have more import for me. You give me an argument from within the faith, and you're arguing your position about the faith from inside the faith. And uh, that loses a bit of its strength and its potency. So, among its, among its uh, many historical uses, this myth has been employed at... And by the way, the word myth, I'm not using that as a castaway word for what's contained in the scriptures. We've talked about this before, but myth means the corpus, the body of the entire mythos 
or mythology of Judaism, of Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, whatever it might be. Gnosticism, literalism, so on. These are the myth stories contained within. It's not speaking to the veracity of its of its uh, uh, reality or factual structure or anything like that. So, um, among the many historical uses, the myth has been employed at many different times to explain death, its cause, its fault. And our fear of snakes has been part of that mythology. It's the snake's fault. The legitimate patriarchal social structures that privilege male interests. It's her fault. The woman that she gave me, said Adam. She gave me the apple thing. Blame the woman. And this set the stage for Christian interpretations of Jesus' execution. It's Adam's fault. But Christ's death can redeem us. It's Adam's fault because, remember the the Bible verse, maybe you don't remember, it says, uh, through the first Adam, sin entered the world, and through the second Adam, will be redeemed from it. And so this would be Adam and then Christ, the Redeemer. And uh, prop up Mary's virginity. Uh, her purity redeems Eve's fault. While Eve is forever in the literalist orthodox point of view, the woman who led man astray, uh, Mary is the woman whom mothered, birthed and mothered the Savior of the world. Um, you can justify the murder of women as witches through this. Women being heirs of Eve are naturally disposed to sensuality and to sin. Do you know that that was at the base of the argument of the witch, of witch trials? It's a woman. Uh, deny women, it, it was used to deny women medical means to lessen the suffering in childbirth. Who are we to deny, deny God's curse on Eve? In pain will you labor to give birth, was one of the curses placed on the woman. And it was used to support slavery in ante, antebellum America. Domination and labor are inescapable outcomes of God's punishment of our first parents, Adam and Eve. These are some of the historical uses of this myth. More recently, the same myth, this creation myth, this sin myth, this uh, serpent myth, has been invoked to reject modern science in creationism. It's, it's, it's been used to demean gay men. It was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, as one bumper sticker put it several years ago. Uh, and it's been used to deconstruct patriarchy. Eve was framed out of Adam's rib, reads another. We talked about a lot of these things. You notice as we mentioned these, we kind of hit on a lot of these things over the last year and a half. So the tale appears to be unusually plastic. Historically speaking, however, the story, like the Garden of Eden itself, does seem to get some basic boundaries around what is possible and what is real. We're last, not last week, a couple of weeks ago, we threw up that map of Eden that I had done for one of my books. And you can see that the biblical description of where Eden lies, you can still see it in the map. <coughs> uh, of that region, by the way. So, the tale appears usually unusually plastic, even though it holds some elements of truth to it. Uh, the story, like the garden itself, does seem to get some basic boundaries around what's possible, what is, what's real, what exists. And it's definitely invoked some rather consistent patterns or of response or interpretation over the centuries. And among these, the sexual has occupied an important, even central place. Now, I've said when talking about the Garden of Eden story and the sexuality of it, it is, the story is not a story of 
forbidden fruit and uh, thumbing our nose at God and his command. The story is a story of sexuality, sexual discovery, impregnancy. It's the story of the need for the coming birth of a kinsman redeemer, according to the mythology. It's the story of Eve having sex with Nakosh, one of the Elohim. And then she brings that sex and goes, hey, look at this great thing. Uh, join me in it, she says to Adam. Or she brings Adam into it. And it's a, as I've mentioned before, this kind of esoteric uh, uh, Garden of Eden three-way. And Eve, the result is Eve bears twin children. One being the son of Adam, the other being the son of Nakosh, the serpent seed theory. And I'm not getting into retelling that, but that's that's what that's about when we talk about sexuality taking place in all of this. Uh, so this erotic focus is partly a function of the first creation myth. In Genesis 1, 1 through, or Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, uh, where God creates human beings in his own image. It's Genesis 1, 27. And in its original Hebrew context, this is almost certainly a reference to the physical likeness of God's body, which, is the, which as the myth suggests, is bisexual, or perhaps better, a male androgen. Androgyny. Andro, androgyne. 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 Yeah, you got the word. A-N-D-R-O-G-Y-N-E. And hence the earth creatures are created as male and female, in his own image. However, we choose to read such biblical genders and gender bending, and such ideas certainly constitute in, uh, like David Carr's words, he said, an, uh, an affirmation of male and female sexual bodies as signs of the divine. You ever think of it that way? In the image of God... Singular God, it says, he made male and female. And so, in other words, this ancient Israelite text suggests that our flesh, our bodies, this stuff we're made of, is in the divine image. It's one of the primary things that was very good, as God declared it, about us, humans. And this is how the Bible begins. Now, early rabbinic interpretations certainly understood all of this stuff. Uh, the rabbinic interpretations, the Jewish rabbinic schools, they suggested variously that Adam was in fact an androgenine, I can't say that word, and it looks like androgyne or androgyne. It's androgyne. I don't know how to pronounce it right. Um, he was the androgyne. Uh, before woman was split off to form the couple, that Adam had sex with the animals. This is one of the rabbinic traditions. Adam had sex with the animals before God made Eve. And is that a weird picture in your head? Bestiality? Adam had sex with animals before God finally figured out what a woman was. <laughs> Because he made, um, God made the man, but he didn't make a counterpart. And then he figured out what a woman was and what a man could do with a woman. And Adam, after all, was trying them out as companions, according to the scripture. And he was naming them. And that Eve had sex with the serpent. Uh, the medieval Kabbalistic authors uh, could be equally bold and insightful if not quite so positive about it. Abraham Ablafia, for example, he unabashedly identified the knowledge of the forbidden tree with sex and the couple's sexual shame with our own. Intercourse, he said, is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil and is a matter of disgust, and one ought to be ashamed at the time of the act. I'm turning my eyes, O oh Lord, 
I'm averting my face from the naked woman thou hast put before me. Or vice versa. Reverse the roles. So early Christian commentators speculated variously and sexually as well. Indeed, the sexual readings of the story of the Garden of Eden were so common that Augustine, in 354 to 430 was when he lived, he found it necessary to argue against the symbolic equation of tree and sexual intercourse in his The Literal Meaning of Genesis. And modern American English use has always had its own insights, uh, even if we don't always recognize their connection to these first few chapters of the Bible. Talk about morning wood. Hey, sprouting a woody. You know, these are all things that have to do with the sacred tree, the tree of life. What are you doing there? You got handcuffs on. There's my, my young child showing you how handcuffed she is. Okay, go out and play in the prison. Okay, bye. I'm doing a radio show. See ya. I don't have a prison. Oh, okay. That's the way we like them to think. They don't even know they're in prison. All right, bye. All right, I'll be done in a while. All right, so, <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Familial interludes. No watchdog at the gate. <laughs> so this whole idea of... Uh, of the uh, tree of life and the sexual intercourse and the literal meanings of things and so on. And uh, English speakers, for example, speak jokingly of how he knew her with a very heavy and winking accent on the word knew. And Adam knew his wife. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, this was of carnal knowledge and the so-and-so being forbidden fruit. Oh, what's the forbidden fruit? Would that be the JJ? <laughs> yeah, we're intellectuals. Yeah, we're scholarly. We're academics. We're talking about cool esoteric stuff. But we can call it the JJ and uh, the wiener. Just to uh, make it easier for some people to, to hear this stuff without going, Oh my God, we're talking about sexual stuff. So, um... Forbidden fruit. All transparently sexual innuendos that take us back to the Garden of Eden story. Whether we admit it or not, we already know this. But this is where this all comes from. And after Freud, feminism, and 200 years of biblical scholarship, we can add even more striking accents to our unacknowledged gnosis. We can notice, for example, that knowledge itself is indeed heavily sexualized in ancient Hebrew thought. The first verse of chapter 4 of Genesis begins, An Adam knew Eve, with a long line of begats following. The genealogies start there. And Adam knew his wife Eve and begat Cain and Abel and Seth and blah, 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 and so on. And that the immediate response of the couple after eating the fruit was sexual shame. They realized that they were naked. Remember that? And that quite faithful to the biblical legal thought, their punishments fit the unspoken but nevertheless transparent crime. Eve is going to suffer in childbirth was the judgment passed on her by God. Which, of course, is the result of sexual intercourse. And Adam is going to toil in the fields, agriculture being in the ancient world an expression of male fertility, husbandry, privilege, and priority. And hence the biblical and fantastically incorrect metaphor of the male seed containing all that's important except the feminine ground. It needs to germinate and grow. Put baldly for the sake of any argument here, the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that God forbade the beautiful couple to eat was sex. Sweet, delicious sex. That's what God was forbidding them from doing. Because you remember, and I've talked about this before, and I've said this in lots of interviews and things like that when I've talked about these things, about my own books and stuff. I said, you know, it was interesting that as soon as 
Eve took of the fruit from the serpent and she passed it on to Adam and they both ate of it. Now, the picture we're taught is that, well, they sinned because there was a literal piece of fruit that God told them not to eat of this literal tree. Well, she listened to the voice of the snake who told her, it's okay, you're not going to die. She eats it, gives to Adam. What happens? Next phrase in the Bible. Poof! They realized their eyes were opened and that they were naked. Why naked? What's naked got to do with it? Because it's all a story about sexuality. And who brought that to the table for Adam and Eve? First, we got Adam, who is attempting to intercourse sexually with the animals. When finally God said, ah, you know, there's none of these animals are going to be the right thing for him. We know. Let's put him to sleep and we'll take a rib and form a woman. Which they did, the counterpart. Why did they create the counterpart? Adam was already having sex with the animals, according to rabbinic tradition, some rabbinic tradition. And God created the woman so he could have sex with her. But it was Nakash who taught them how to do it. He brought the heavenly gift, so to speak. So, all of this is kind of a, you got to put the, the tag on it. Well, sort of. Actually, the fruit was clearly not just sex. Uh, as we use that word way too loosely and mundanely nowadays. Sex, sex, sex. Everything's sex. So, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, the fruit functions as a type of erotic gnosis that was understood to affect immediately both moral awareness and the divinization of the human being. That is what their eyes were opened meant. It wasn't just sex. Eating of this forbidden fruit brought moral awareness and divinization of the human being. Oh, the humans have eaten the fruit of the tree of life and have become like gods. Let us therefore prevent them from eating also of the tree at the center of the garden, lest they live forever, as the verse in Genesis 3.23 says. And so the, the, the fruit functions as this divine erotic gnosis that brought this awareness. The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that the knowing serpent offers the couple to eat, after all, is understood by the myth to be both this uh, um, um, kind of a, a, a partial divinization. Their eyes are opened. They become like us, like the Elohim. And it's a preparatory stage to the couple awakening more fully to their own immoral natures. And so, indeed, God states quite clearly that the two have already become like one of us through the act of eating the fruit, exactly as the serpent had promised. Was it some magical fruit they eat? Uh, the crunch, munch, munch, poof. I think like God now. No, it was something completely different, a metaphoric picture. Um... And it later points out in this story, though, that should the couple manage to eat of the second tree of life, they'd live forever. Did you even realize there were two trees in that story? We've talked about that before. When we talked about some of the things I've written about. And looking at that story in depth, did you know there was more to that? Did you know there's more than one tree? So it's a rather tragic way for Western religious thought than the story seems to suggest that God stands against our own moral maturity, against sexuality, and against the divinization of human nature through the acquisition of knowledge and sensual pleasure. It also insinuates in this story, when it doesn't actually shout it, it insinuates that we all die because our first parents knew each other within the intimate 
gnosis of sexual intercourse. Because they fucked, we're screwed, is the implication there. And through this troubling logic, the serpent's gift was turned into an ancient curse. And the gracious giver into the devil himself. As the testimony of truth uh, quoted in the, uh, the opening of the show, I quoted that, uh, caustically observed almost 2,000 years ago. So certainly not everyone was duped, though. Some of the early Gnostic Christians, for example, they recognized that the serpent's presence involved the revelation of sexual desire. And by the way, by the serpent, we're not talking about the serpent, follow me, I am Satan. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about Nakosh. By definition in the book of Genesis, the illuminator, the bright shining one, the bright shining prince of heaven, the deliverer of forbidden knowledge. Why was it forbidden? Because God didn't want his creation knowing these things. Was he keeping them innocent or keeping them dumb? is the question. This is a way to look at it from the outside, by the way. Not everyone was duped. The serpent's presence involved the revelation of sexual desire. And the Apocryphon of John, for example, records the following exchange. It says this, quote, Lord, was it not the serpent that taught them? He smiled and said, The serpent appeared to them for sexual desire. And the elaborate sexual mythology, sperm mysticisms, the seed of Seth, of the Sethians, the implied sexual rituals of that ancient corpus of texts generally collected under the rubric of Gnosticism more than bears out the Savior's mischievous smile, as we shall see in due time with this series. I'll tell you what I mean by that. In any case, for reasons that still aren't clear, but that certainly involved rumors and reports of these communities, sexual beliefs and practices, the Gnostic Christians were viciously attacked by the Orthodox leaders, and they eventually drove them underground until their haunting voices were erased from any accurate historical memory. Until, that is, they were dug up again in 1945 near Nag Hammadi, beneath all the bird poop and bat shit in the caves. And very much like these early Gnostic insights that raged and grinned so against the more traditional readings, the modern study of religion can help us to recognize the wise snake, the wise serpent, the loving lovely couple, the angry, jealous God among us, the garden of delight, of pleasure, of paradise. It turns out, much like Jesus' kingdom of heaven, still within us. And if only we can learn to open our eyes a little bit and have the courage to act accordingly, the fruit hangs right before us and on and on in us. And the serpent still hisses his promised gift. And it's up to us, now, how we tell the story from here. And so that's all we got time for tonight, folks. Tomorrow we're going to get into faith, reason, and gnosis. That's where we're moving right after this. What do you think of this? Where's your head on this? Let me know. Give me feedback. And we'll see you again here tomorrow night. We're going to take a 23-hour break. You guys have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow.